Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways Podcast, Empire the Masquerade Chronicle, Shards of San Francisco. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Rena, and tonight we're dealing with the after effects of some very interesting interpersonal relationships from last episode. We'll see how that goes. In the meantime, I would like to thank all of our listeners and our Patreon supporters. We literally could not do any of this without you. If you would like to support us through Patreon, you can do so, do so at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast, where you will also find many entrancing delights for your ears and your ears only. So now let's get on to the show. Start with some introductions to my right. Hi, this is Mike and I play Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja. And next to Mike. Hi, this is John. I'll be playing Sylvester LaViolette of uh, Clan Gangrel. And next to Sylvester. Hi, my name is Tegan, and I'm playing Rum, the shaman of Clan Malkavian. And next to Tegan, we have... Hi, I'm Allie, and I play Katerina Bogdanovich of Clan Toreador. Next to Allie, we have... Hello, hello, my name is Bridget, and I am playing Monica West of Clan Salubri. And last but never least... This is Tiffany, and I play Alex Giovanni of Clan Hakata. And she calls me Daddy. Speaking of daddies, let's get right into the episode. So we are starting on a new night after what happened. Cleaning up Monica's party. There's been a murder. The hunters are at large in the city. And, uh, well, our vampires have had some very, very interesting interactions with humans and each other. And we'll see how those go tonight. So let's start with some rouse checks across the board. See who wakes up hungry this evening. I have a 10. So Katarina's riding that high from her uh, session with Sophie the night before. Fester's doing pretty good. He's mad as hell. God damn it, Tegan. So you're at three. Uh, I succeeded. Okay, so Alex is fine. Alex did have quite a uh, decent array of snacks the night before. Monica made it as well. Monica's fine. Uh, How about Marcus? I failed my rouse check. Oh, my. Rom, you're feeling a little hungry this evening. Problem is, you just don't you just don't drain people. And so you're most of the time you have trouble actually getting down to not hungry, especially with all the ghouls you have to feed. You're constantly feeling just like the munchies. And then you don't eat for a couple nights because you forgot because you were feeding your ghouls. And suddenly here we are. Exactly. But that's okay. I can feed from my ghouls, though, right? Oh, yes, you can. The the few who are still left on your boat after you sent most of them away. Oh, good. Casper. Perfect. Fantastic. I was in the mood for Polish. Anyway. So you want some kielbasa? I got it. Okay, so you call Casper in and you have a bit of a snack. You're not hungry enough that you need to resist draining, but you're only going to be reduce your hunger by one because you're just taking a snack. But still, it's better than, you know, being halfway to feral. Well, a Casper a day keeps the feral rom away, so it's perfect for that situation. I am hella concerned with the current situation, but what I'm going to do first is on a new night. I'm going to reach out to Marcus and I'm going to ask him if 
he needs any support right now, how best he could use what we have and the resources that I have been gathering over time. I don't want to just go strike out on my own and go hunt some hunters because that's not really a Rom thing to do. Rom's more of a like, hey, buddy. He's a lover, not a fighter. I uh, can't neither confirm nor deny those allegations, but I'm going to call Marcus this fine evening because I also have a confession. Oh, no. So, Marcus, you slept pretty well. And, you know, it's a night where you don't have to be as concerned as you used to be about an attempt on your life. That's nice. But it was a bit of a of an agitating night last night. You did lose a close friend from before. And there's hunters moving around and nobody really enjoys that. So you're feeling a bit peckish when you wake up this evening. Do you have any business that you attend to before Rom calls? Or are you just taking it easy? You're not really the Baron anymore, so... No, just Marcus. Mm -hmm. You do have some notes from Gloria, who has been reorganizing the union business. She's, with the help of some of her other union contacts with the Longshoremen's Union, there's a, a warehouse with some minor office space, some cubicles that she's been working on setting up over the past few nights just to keep business flowing until you can get a new building. And she says that the police report for the fire has come in and that she will be sending it over by messenger shortly and she is not happy with it. But that's really the only business you have at, at the moment. Jean hasn't come in yet. Assume she's probably still working at home with the with House La Sombra deciding what to do next. And Esmeralda is off being Esmeralda. So... This evening, you do get a phone call from one Rom the Shaman, who disappeared mysteriously last night during the party. Okay. Marcus, I don't even know what to call you anymore. Here's the deal. That's actually part of the problem. You see, you and me set up a big infrastructure project, and I'm holding these keys. I'm holding these the, this, this, this thing. Is this still yours? Is this something you want me to keep private? Or is this something that you wanted to share with the other members of this new union, our network? Because, um, yeah, about that. Before you make that decision, I wanted you to know um, I was trying to be a good partner to your enterprise and I um Rom are you sure you want to confess this over the phone that thing is bigger than 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 you asked it to be how much bigger uh full full coverage you got you got that I was anticipating I was anticipating the need okay so just you know, it was a good thing. Just it's it's everywhere in the town. So now you you've got that, but that's it's right now it's it's yours and mine. And you got to decide whether this is going to be an us thing or a we thing or a me thing. I think we originally talked about sharing it with certain people. And I think that that plan still should continue forward. Certain people, if nothing else, because of what's going on, it might be even more useful. But as for who, that's something we should discuss in private, not on the phone. Yeah, no worries. Do you want me to like grab you like a thing? You want me to come in? You want me to, what you want me to do? What you do? What you got going on? Hmm. Meet me at the Port of San Francisco, Rom. The main building tonight, say two hours. That's perfect. You know what? You know, my favorite thing about you is that you specify what building. Like, that's so goddamn useful. 
I don't end up, you know, standing next to a porta potty somewhere near Pier 7. All right, I'll be there. Two hours. All right. Come alone. All right, bye. So that, you have your conversation with Rom, and uh, it's very dramatic ending. He hangs up, and you have a couple hours to do whatever it is you need to do. Whatever pressing business you may or may not have, uh, you get a note hand delivered uh, from Sir Roger, uh, suggesting that you'll need to meet at some point in the next few nights to, uh, along with Mariam, work out details for keeping San Francisco running, elections, and so forth. Uh, he literally says. You can hear it almost in his voice as you read this letter. It's very hard not to. He's very distinctive. But other than that, you have a couple hours to yourself, which you have not had for quite some time. Yeah, sounds wonderful, actually. Look to feed at some point. And the difficulty there for me is that I sort of have a particular type in a particular way. So I'd probably go back to or go back into the bedroom and let uh, Katerina know that I'm going to need to feed. I would offer you Sophie, but I know that she is not how you hunt. No, you know how I hunt. I do. I will be here when you get back. And I'll step out and uh, into the night of San Francisco. So Marcus will head out on a hunt. It won't be too difficult for you to find someone out running, jogging, any of those things. Not in San Francisco, especially because the rain from the previous night has passed. So we will leave Marcus to his hunting for the moment. And Katerina? Uh, I'm going to text Vlad. Hey, you text Vlad, uh, who is one of Jane's childer, down, the one who works with you down at the clinic. And he responds quickly, saying, uh, available tonight. And I will text him to please come over to the Haven and bring a fresh body with him. Sounds like fun. And you don't get a, any further response after that. But he does show up about 30 minutes later with a box. It's about the size of a Christmas tree box. He's just carrying it over one shoulder. He's dressed like a delivery man, just in case anyone's looking. Good evening. Good evening. I have a body. So I'm going to make sure the vault is open uh, ahead of time. Yeah, the the bodyguards on the door open it for him. I have a surprise for you. Um, in our business, I'm not sure surprises are nice things. Don't worry. You and I are going to have some fun this evening. He looks at the box and looks back at you and goes, ah, more my kind of fun. Yes. He carries the box in. He looks at Sophie, raises an eyebrow, looks back at you. As I'm assume fun is this one. Yes. You want uh, work done? Yes, I would like to uh, flesh craft her. Sophie starts pulling back as best as she can. She's still chained to the chair and mm -hmm. she her eyes are wide this time in terror. It's not the same kind of fear when you turned on the dread gaze the night before. This is sheer actual terror. Hmm. Okay. But uh, and he bows slightly, just a slight from the shoulder bow towards you in, in deference. Is uh, not uh, free. Yes? Yes. We do not um, do things uh, gratis. It would be beneficial to both of us. I offer her as whatever testing you need to do. He looks her over. Hmm? Could use practice. Uh... You understand I'm not uh, as uh, skill as Jane, yes? Yes. Which is why I offer her to you. 
for practice. Okay, but uh, is favor exchanged, huh? That? Like how Kindred do things in other place? Yes, she is part of the favor. Okay, I think is okay. And he reaches out a hand to shake hands with you, and he's got seven fingers on that hand. No problem. No problem. So he shakes hands with you and sets down the box. He looks at Sophie, plants his hands on his very big hips. I think can have fun, yes? And Sophie starts screaming. We'll come back to you in a bit. Monica, you wake up in one of the store closets at Mackay Gardens with Chase in a complete state of undress. You didn't really have time to get home the night before. By the time you finished uh, expressing aggression. That's a fair articulation. Yes, it was a little too close to sunrise. And so you went back at it and then promptly passed out, both of you. And it is now another night. You have woken up. Annalise is at the house all by herself. Can't have been getting up to any mischief whatsoever. And it is a new night. Chase sits up. He stretches those long, tawny arms of his. And he looks at you with a slight smirk. She will pull herself to her knees and wrap herself around the back of him where her head is kind of like hanging over her or his shoulders and she's wrapped around him. 80 years, Chase. I cannot believe you denied me that for 80 years. And she nuzzles into him. Well, it's rather frowned upon in Camarilla territory. Hey, speaking of that, I have questions. You shock me. (laughs) Uh... She'll nibble at the uh, lobe of his ear. Where are we? Are we going to be public facing? They all think we're fucking anyways. I don't know if it would really matter, but that's more of a you decision than it is mine. We can be. Yep. I really enjoy these conversations with you, Chase. I'm asking you, what would you prefer? Well, I suppose they already think we are anyway. Might as well. You might want to tell the Hikata first. Okay, so that actually leads into my second question. Could you define mine? And he leans in and he kisses your forehead and strokes your cheek and says, No matter where you go, darling, you'll have to come back to me. And she nuzzles into him. He runs a hand across your collarbone very softly. Just... Anyone else who comes in, they might be able to have you for a little bit, but only a little bit. She nods and she smiles. She says, I know where home is. That's right. You do. And she's going to swing around where she can actually just kind of like straddle in and just kind of like plop into the lap. It's nothing overly sensual about it other than the fact that she's still nude, but it looks like she's still in inquiry mode, which is very quintessential Monica. And what else do you have to ask, darling? I know that look. It's just two... I know. It's just two more things, and I know you're busy. Um, Only two? Depending on the answers, maybe just two. Can we... Will you help me try to unburden the bestial soul with Annalise? I've, I've never done it before, but I'm assuming you do know how to... His shoulders tighten noticeably, especially because you're resting one hand on one of them. You want to expend energy and power on that demon child. Mm -hmm. There is a long pause. And he looks like he wants to say something. Like he's holding something back. And if you want to try and figure out what that is, you can give me persuasion plus manipulation. Oh, she will go for that. Because you know he's keeping something from you. You can tell it at, after all this time and also being so close and looking into all three of his eyes. 
Yep, for sure. Uh, difficulty number is three. Okay. And she got three successes. So you make triple eye contact with him, and that third eye is very intense looking back at his. And he takes a deep sigh, and his shoulders relax a little bit. And he says, I need to show you something. And he slides you off his lap, and he turns. And he lifts his shoulder, and you can see just under the arm, where you can, you barely can see it. And you, you only notice it now because he's drawing your attention to it. It's funny, all these years of sharing a bed, even non-sexually, you never notice this. It was usually the arm that he kept away from you. Hmm on the other side and you see that there is tattooed into the skin but it looks fresh somehow even though it can't be there is a symbol and it is the clan Tremere symbol Uh with an upside down cross behind it I think she's going to stagger looking at that. Mostly, how does she miss that for so long? But if she wasn't looking for it, or maybe it's just And if he was intentionally hiding it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that Tremere have a way of giving permanent tattoos on kindred bodies? Didn't think it was possible with how things tend to reset. Cut your hair back following night change your body unless you're a dragon it comes back their blood workings they know how to do it and it just stays and you can't get rid of it it's just there and you never forget because it burns and I think she's probably going to have to fight back tears in this moment and she's just going to hug him I'm sorry I didn't know. He shakes his head, and this is the most vulnerable he's ever been with you. I was going to say, like, out of 80 years, they've been rocking with, like, a don't ask, don't tell with his past, more or less. Your request seems to to try and save Annalise, seems to have shocked this out of him. He lowers his, his arm so that the he's covering that small tattoo again, and he says, no one knows. That's the point. It's a long time ago, but you don't forget. Ever. I think she's just going to bite her bottom lip and nod. If it is that important to you, maybe. I will help you try it, but I will not. Drawing a Tremere soul into my body... And you see the way he tenses up, Monica, and it kind of breaks your heart the way he pulls away because you saw that kind of trauma response in the camps. Yeah. You know this kind of reaction. It's instinctive. It's out of his control, his usual calm control that he has. And he just shakes his head slightly. I will not. And then he stands up. His body language shifts, indicating this conversation is over, or at least this part of it. That's fair. And he starts starts putting his pants on. He has closed out that portion of the conversation, and uh, Monica's always been very big on boundaries, so she's not going to push that. But as she is... Helping him get dressed, uh, arming him into his collared shirt and just kind of like buttoning up. There is one last thing I think we should have clarity on. It's my last one, I promise. If you must. That comment you made last night, that can't ever happen again. Which one? Mm Hmm... And she is kind of like pulling a hand over her her eyebrow because Bridget and Monica are just realizing that they were fucking last night. She's referring to two nights before. No, sorry. Um, At Elysium. 
the statement you made about I could leave you. Well, that's not going to happen now, is it? Chase, it can't happen, is what I'm telling you. I wouldn't let it anyway. Okay. Smile. And she's going to hug him, and she's going to kiss him directly under the chin. And then she's going to lean back, and all three eyes are going to lock onto him. Because if you ever do fucking try to leave me, I'll kill us both. That is an absolutely appropriate response to such a situation. I need to get home. I left that child alone all night. I, um, He shudders. Go check in on the demon. <laughs> and as you turn to go, he puts a hand on your shoulder. And he turns you slightly and he says, Just don't challenge me again. Understood? Yes, sir. Good girl. And he pushes you out the door with a slap on the ass. Oh, wonderful. Oh, no, romper too? That was amazing. And she's going to run back to the house as quickly as she can. Okay, so you're running back to the house to see what mischief the tiny Tremere has gotten up to in your absence. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's have a check in on Alex. You had an interesting fun night at the club down in the Castro last night. Nothing went wrong, thankfully. You had a few hours watching some tricks, contortions, some really good O-negative. Jane wasn't, wasn't wrong about that. Frank never came in, at least as far as you're aware. You've never actually met Frank, but there were no other Zemitsi that you could see other than Jane, one of Jane's childer, the young man, the young himbo known as Chad, who just came in, wandered, took a drink, waved at you vacantly, and left. And so it is now a new night, and you have a lot of information swirling around in your brain, and also a head in the fridge. It's in the freezer now. I don't want it to rot. Ah, so you have a head in the freezer. Yeah. I think I will probably... As I'm getting ready for the evening, um, have a chat with Luther, see what he's heard or seen out and about. Um, I got a cat. I got. I have to check in with Eddie about the Dana Rosenthal and see where that's going because they were supposed to reach out to her. I think. So Luther materializes in your apartment. He hasn't been around very much for the past few nights. He's briefly mentioned some issues going on on the other side uh, that he needed to take care of, and he's also been trying to find Mina when her spirit kind of flashed out after Vince, you assume, at the point where he officially went into torpor. She just got weaker and weaker and then disappeared. But he does materialize this evening, his hands in his spectral trench coat pockets, fiddling with a cigarette. So, <laughs> hunters, huh? That's what they say. And I kind of know. Yeah, Mallet, he's a bastard. I wanted to let you know that um, I am zeroing in on Kate Markovich to get her here for Mina. Also, is there anything you need help with that you're dealing with on the other side? He just shakes his head and rubs his spectral temples a little bit, says, There's a lot of noise. Just so much fucking noise over here. And there's a lot of other wraiths just losing composure. <laughs> Not quite like how I went. He smiles slightly. Something is agitating the kind wraiths over here. Hmm. There's not that many kindred wraiths, really. Just me, Mina, a few others. But the kind wraiths are getting really worked up about something. Is Van Ness over there? Nope. She was. <laughs> oh, she got... Ripped up hard in seconds, Nazi bitch. Nice. Well, although if otherwise I was going to take care of her, but... Yeah, as soon as she popped up, I thought, wait until Alex gets a hold of her. 
and then a bunch of the kind wraiths honed in on her, and poof. Wow. It's, it's, it's almost like there are repercussions if you're a horrible monster. Uh-huh. I get the feeling she had a lot of victims over here, waiting around for her to show up. Uh, you don't say. <laughs> well, Giovanni, what do you need from your favorite ghost sheriff? Um, I just wanted to see what was going on, what you've heard or seen. So have you, do you notice if there's a certain area that they're getting worked up in or it's just a general feeling? It started with a general feeling. I've been tracking it back. It's hard to explain how geography works over here. I don't know how familiar you are with this side of the veil. Me personally, not very much, but I know enough because of the family. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of shifting. Things move around, but there are some places that stick. And there's a particular spot that is radiating some kind of horrible energy, and I try not to go anywhere near it. I, I don't think I'd want to go near it on your side of the veil either. If it's a real place. What does it look like? No, oh, it's this big building, huge auditorium. I think it's a church. We don't really have religious iconography here. That all tends to bleed away. And I went in the one time. There was what looked like a pulpit and uh, what do they call it? A baptismal. It was huge. Things swimming in it. Ugh. Ugh. I, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. You can actually see him shudder. Look, it's a bad place. Right? I'm not touching that fucking place. Right? That's all I gotta say. Do you think if we got rid of it on this side, it would take care of it on that side? I don't think so. I think some of those creatures would then just go free, right? I don't know what causes it, but it makes me agitated. I can't really stay in it. You know, I couldn't physically go in religious places when I was still a kindred. It's not quite the same here, but it still causes pressure in this form I've got. And it's very hard to stay in that place. Interesting. There's bad stuff in that place. I know. I know. It's a bit rich coming from a vampire who's now a ghost. Yeah, no, I think I know where you're talking about. Another one of Mallet's doings. He briefly showed up here. Did you know that? I'm sure he didn't last very long. Yeah. Oh, it was only for a second. Like with Felix when he popped up for a moment and was gone, but he was ho oh, ho mad as fuck. <laughs> oh, we love to see it. And now, well, now he's gone forever. So fuck that guy. Yeah, 100%. So nice to know he's gone. But if you need help with the mess he left, I can't help you with that place. No, that's fine. I don't know how much I'm involved with anything. Just trying to take care of other promises that I've made. You know, trying to get Mina back and sorted. Get you sorted so that you're comfortable again doing whatever you're doing. There's, I've seen more gangrel, so I'm sure you really want to communicate or... Yeah, I hear Sylvester's back in town. Haven't seen that guy in a while, but with all the chaos over here, it's hard for yeah. me to manifest most places. Your place is the easiest, being where it is. Yeah, well, it's okay. Sylvester smells really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like Sylvester. Like, I mean, you guys, you know, do your thing and, you know, smell like earth and whatever. That's fine, but... Dude needs a bath. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. 
I've already tried. I don't think it's going to happen. If you hear anything else, uh, anything I need to be aware of or anything I can help with, you let me know. Like I said, I'm going to see. If you can find out if your hunter problem is kind specific, I can maybe help. Or they wouldn't be expecting wraiths to haunt their shit. But if they're expecting me, not much I can do. They'll ward the fuck out of everything. Yeah, I don't know. As far as I know, they're just... They were aimed at us, uh, at the Kindred. So, and their only targets so far seem to be Kindred. But I'm also not friendly with every single wraith in this city as of yet. So. Well, I'm going back to keep looking for Mina. If I'm needed, you know how to call me. Hey, you may want to check Sacramento. Maybe she got rubber banded to Kate. Good point. I'll see what I can do. And he presses his fingers to his temples again. If I can get through this fucking noise. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. And he vanishes. Then I'm going to get a hold of Eddie and see if he got a hold of Dana or somebody, you know, where she works or whatever. Yeah, Ed, Eddie responds saying he's got a pretty decent file between him and Luz and that he's going to pass everything over to Lila to bring you because it's too much to send by text. Totally acceptable. Lila should be coming by at some point with a file for you to look at. Then I will head to Elysium. Yes, got to go get that good, good gossip, especially after what happened the other night in Elysium. Yeah. It's sure to be humming. So we'll leave Alex en route to Elysium for the moment and have a check-in with Sylvester. Sylvester, Mariam told you in, uh, in no uncertain terms not to do anything stupid. So that limits your options significantly. Yeah. And like, while I generally can operate outside of clan structure to some extent, the chief for the region telling me specifically not to go off half-cocked is not one of those things I can get away with. But she did tell me what I can do, which is gather intel. Mm -hmm. So last night I made some calls. In person. Not <laughs> Again, do not have a phone. Refuse to have a phone because that's how they find you. Sylvester has now got an MP3 player <laughs> with a couple of podcast episodes of this preacher's material. And um, he is currently in the data gathering mm -hmm. portion of work. The podcast that you've discovered, which appears to be derivative of his actual radio show that mm -hmm. he has, because some people still listen to the radio, it's called The Cleansing Fire. Not at all ominous. Nope. And the very first episode, this is this episode is from a couple years ago. He is giving a massive rant. No guest on this episode, just him ranting about the breakup of the traditional family mm -hmm. and the end of family structure and how it's all the gays' fault and how America would be a stronger, better place if Obama, and he he does the conservative thing of the full name Barack Hussein Obama, uh, hadn't legalized gay marriage. And he is just full-blown rant. It's actually very hard for you to listen to more than a few minutes of it because it sounds like he's slamming his fist into a table or a pulpit at some point, multiple times. He is yelling into the microphone, plosives everywhere. And it, it's just the vitriol in his voice at an entire group of people is very hard for you to hold on to without wanting to go eat his face. Yeah, it's a... Uh playback speed gets increased and then he just starts like skipping through and like trying to just find recurrent patterns uh how this guy talks and one thing i think that becomes clear to him is that back in the four in the 30s and 40s uh sylvester could speak german for a little while <laughs> he has been around long enough that he has forgotten most of the things that he hasn't kept up with just because he hasn't been using them so he's just like uh-huh 
This reminds me of stuff that I heard and stuff that I read. It's not quite the same, but it's close enough. The rhetoric that's used is very similar to what you remember, the, the things that you heard on the radio and just from some of the rallies that you snuck into mm. back in the 30s and the 40s. Just it's the same kind of rhetoric, even if the target is different. And even yeah. even though it's the language is slightly different, it's still that same kind of rhetoric and it really sets your hackles off. And then you skip ahead a few episodes because the older ones aren't going to have all the information you need, but at least you know the kind of thing you're getting into now. And you're sitting under on this park bench under a tree with Sylvie the pigeon mm. on the bench next to you, fluttering off into a tree whenever a human comes too close and might notice this strange man with a pigeon. But you get into some of the more recent episodes and there's one episode where he is talking about the sin and the darkness laying beneath San Francisco in the shadows, in the dark, the tools of Satan that stalk the streets. And he quotes a fairly well-known Bible verse that the, the adversary stalks like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour, only... He, he says, they're among us and they're not lions this time, but the spawn of Satan will lure you into destruction. And he doesn't say vampires. He doesn't use any of that language. You don't even know if he knows about vampires just from the language he uses, but it's very much amped up. There are people out there who want to take your soul. Satan is active among us. Be wary, be vigilant, look out for, and he lists up, upside down crosses and vandalized churches. Like they want to destroy your soul. All of these things. Just an mm. entire episode about, about the spawn of Satan. And yeah. this is an episode from last week. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> He, he absolutely knows. And that's the... Mm, yeah, he's got to go. Maybe not straight away, but he's got to go. All right, once I've done finished that, I'm off to Elysium. Because now I have to put out feelers. I have to... And for a guy that fucks off to the woods for a decade, I have spent more time in Elysium than I care for in the last week. <laughs> See, sometimes I'm I'm starting to think that Sylvester just has a sense for when Alex is going to be at Elysium so that he can show up there at the same time. I swear to God. I can't, I can't possibly comment. You finish this episode and you slip the MP3 player back into your pocket. It's a Zune. Let's be real. It's a Zune. And you're just kind of shaking your head a bit, but you can feel that that kind of dark static that you felt the night before mm -hmm. after talking to Mariam, that, that kind of danger sense that something is here growing. And you don't know if, if, if you've become even more attuned to it after listening to this vile rhetoric, or if it's just getting stronger down here in this area, but the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up. It's a bad feeling, and I don't care for it. This is absolutely something Mallet would have done. <laughs> he's just like... Like, he just knows the playbook. He's seen enough counter-revolutions. He just knows what's up. You, you, more than most, you in particular, Sylvester, know the kinds of things that people like Mallet, these petty little dictators, do that seem to be against their own self-interest, but the things they do to literally burn to the ground anything that opposes them, it doesn't surprise you that Mallet would have done this. It just makes you angry. It's a good thing he's dead at this point. You set off towards Elysium, making some notes in your brain about uh, gathering more information on this Pastor Easton. Because if he knows 
If he knows, there's some serious trouble. So you head off to Elysium. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's now been a couple hours. Marcus, you've headed out searching for food. And you circle around. You, You haven't found the right person. So you circle around the territory until you come up towards where the union office used to be. And there's a very familiar jogger just going past the building. She seems to slow down just slightly. She goes past the the burned out remains of the union building, but she's there. She's been around a lot. She can't help herself. Her heart rate is up. You can, you can feel it from where you are in the shadows. You can smell the sweat and the adrenaline. All right. I'll slip out at a, uh, a pace, a jogging pace. I'm probably not terribly dressed like a jogger. It's not really my thing. I don't really sweat anyway. And I could quite literally jog for hours and not get tired. I'll jog, I'll jog a little closer to her, but given that this is the union office or the former one, I want to take a good look around. So as you go past the burned out husk, is there anything in specific, anything specifically you're looking for or trying to evaluate? Or are you just trying to get a general vibe? It's not so much the building itself that I'm looking at. It's actually everything else. There's nothing left in the building, but there might be people left here, spare mm-hmm. cars, um, you know, quite frankly, the homeless that I don't recognize, uh, the people that don't fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the the one potential advantage I have in this situation is that I worked here for a very long time and that I know this place and I know the, the people mm-hmm. who frequent this place. Give me a wits awareness roll. It's going to be a uh, low difficulty too because this is your former home turf. So that is three total. Excellent. So you look around, your senses are on high alert. They've been on high alert for quite some time at this point. And you don't see any cop cars around like you did last time, but there is a homeless person crouched up against the side of of one of these other office buildings across the street. To anyone else, they just look like one of the countless houseless people you see around San Francisco, especially at night down near the down near the docks, mm-hmm. leaning against the building, empty bottles around them, ratty old coat pulled up over their legs. But that's a new person you haven't seen here before. And they are very well positioned to see the remnants of your office building. Hmm. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a mental mark of where they're at and then I won't at all slow my pace when I jog. I won't engage with my friendly blonde jogger. Unfortunate state of events. But what I'll do is I'll continue past and basically jog around the the block to get a better view of where they're at and then sort of change up my hunting target. You jog lightly around the block. You don't think that the person who was keeping an eye on the building, if that's what they're doing, really noticed you. You weren't the focus, and there's a couple joggers around, and you move very stealthily with the shadows. And so you jog lightly around, and you can see from different angles how this person is sitting. And you've seen enough homeless people all across San Francisco over the decades to recognize when something is off when you pay attention to one for more than a, than a few seconds. The body posture is slightly wrong. 
they're pretending to be drunk with the bottles everywhere. You can smell, smells like someone spilled maybe cheap beer all over, but their shoulders are too straight and the way they move their head towards the building every now and then, they're alert. They're not some strung out druggie. Okay, so the next question is, is are they simply bait? Because if they're bait, then there's going to be a secondary person and or secondary team that is watching them in hopes that someone like me would happen upon said person. And so that'll be the next thing that I look for. Okay. With that third success on your wits awareness, you don't see other people, but you do pick up as you move into a different angle in your jog. There's a camera Hmm. in that alley and there should not be a security camera in that alley, not for these empty office buildings, but you catch just a glimpse of it because you know where to look. You've had to avoid a lot of these cameras for so long. You just catch the glint up in a corner. It's been well hidden, but not well enough. Fantastic. Okay. So I will uh, change up the tempo of my evening. And I'm going to make a rouse check. Okay. Net is a seven. Excellent. So I'm going to rouse my blood. And I am going to... I'm going to activate prowess. And so I'll get a chance to, if necessary, add all of my potence to um, my physical damage. Mm -hmm. But that's not really why, why I'm calling doctor. Uh, My plan is also to effectively add it to feats of strength. And so I am going to, where is the, in this alleyway, are there any grates or manholes, et cetera, et cetera, or into the leading streets? There's several, not in the alley itself, but close by. You are near the docks. There's a lot of water runoff, especially when it rains. So there's several grates and manholes around here. Okay. Now the camera is watching the burned up union office, or is it watching the person? It's watching the person. Okay. How far up is that camera? Eight feet off the ground. Oh, okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. So what I'd like to do is see about lining up two things. One, the objective would be to take my jogging pass so that way I'm approaching the camera. Eight feet really isn't a masquerade breach to jump from. I mean, there are sports athletes that can easily jump Mm -hmm. eight feet. And so what I'd like to do is jump and pull and rip the camera down. And then when I hit the ground, basically bound forward into a a full-on run directly at that person. Yeah, you get the idea whoever put that camera up was not quite aware of what they were doing. They weren't necessarily putting thought into Mm -hmm. someone trying to take the camera down or anything like that. Yep. So let's go with athletics and dexterity. Certainly. Not that it's going to be much of a problem for you. Well, for me, it's dex, athletic, and, and, and now potence. Yes. So that's a fantastic. All right. So that's eight. Oh, yes. It's absolutely no problem for you. And the way you can move in the dark now and you can see really easily in the dark, thanks to your friends in House La Sombra, you just leap out of a shadow and grab the camera from the side so it has no chance of seeing you are you trying uh, this is i need to ask this question because it's important are you trying to destroy the camera as you pull it or are you no, leaving no. it no okay. i want to um <laughs> pull at the the mounting arm of the camera mm-hmm. and actually mm-hmm. retain the device because it will mean that i have not but one but two presents for rom when i meet them all right so you rip the camera off and with that really good roll um no contest it's still going to be able to get some information off of potentially if rom takes a look at it and you roll forward towards this person and they are completely taken unawares because well they weren't expecting you to leap out of a shadow and grab the security camera and they start to shift back 
but they're up against a wall and moving sideways is hard, especially when you have a mountain of power rolling at you. And they don't manage to react quickly enough before you grab them. I guess when I get a hold of them, I want to just in the quickest of motions, given celerity, uh, I want to use the side of my use the side of my head and strike them directly on the bridge of their nose. Yeah, you just headbutt them full on the nose and their nose shatters. Uh, Because there's nothing, nothing in a fight worse than getting punched in the face. That'll mess your whole day up. Um, Their head slams backward and there is now blood all over their face. Fantastic. I hockey puck them. So I pull their coat up all over the back of their head and I cover their face. And then after that, I use the alleys and the shadows to get back to my vehicle. There's, as we established when you were doing your jog, there isn't really anyone out here other than your jogger who is now moving past this area. Mm. And there were a couple other people walking past, but at this point they've moved on. So you're able to bodily shove this person into your car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm keeping them in the passenger seat. And the reason why is fairly simplistic. So what I'll do once I get to the car is I will pull up the shirt that they're wearing to see if they're covered in anything, whether that be religious symbols, wires, etc. So you pull them up by their shirt and they're trying to talk, but there's blood all pouring down their mouth. Their nose is shattered. They hit their head on the wall. They probably have a bit of a concussion and they're just getting, they're just saying some very slurred kind of nonsense that you can't quite make out. But hilariously, you do find a bulb of garlic in the front pocket of their shirt. Mm-hmm. Just oh, a bulb yeah. of garlic, an entire That's bulb fantastic. of garlic and three crosses there's, there's a Catholic crucifix, there's an Eastern Orthodox cross, and just your generic cross sort of pendant, as if they weren't sure which cross was the right one to use. This is like Benny from the Mummy. All right. Uh, I'm going to, what in what possibly could be relatively frightening for them, I'm going to chuckle. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? <laughs> Who are you? Jesus, man. I'm going to bite them. You just lean over and sink your fangs into their throat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I would like to use another power because it's evidently power night at the the gym tonight. And I'm going to use a presence power on them, which is lingering Mm -hmm. kiss. It's absolutely free. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last person to feel it was that fair jogger back there. So lingering kiss gives them a feeling of absolute intense pleasure and ecstasy and so you sink your fangs in and oh that's that's nice man yeah so what i'm gonna do is i'm I'm gonna sate one hunger um, because that's something i need i need that from them and after that i'm gonna leave them in bliss and continue to pat them down specifically for electronic devices phones pagers Etc. And you start patting them down and you find a phone, a newer model smartphone in one pocket. Mm-hmm. And you find a an active voice recorder Ooh. in their back pocket. Fantastic. It is running. I take that and I will stop it. Their phone, I pull the battery. And since I have had to do this recently, I will also take the SIM out of it. I don't break either, but I want to remove them so that way they're not active. And then... Once I have that stowed in the glove box, I turn the car over and I drive to the pier. Okay. So you drive down to the pier with your gift bag for Rom, essentially. Got a swag bag coming, Rom. Let's shift over to Elysium for the moment with Marcus driving his gift bag. Uh, A very drugged out, blissed, happy gift bag. So... Alex, you arrive at Elysium. You greet Sebastian, who is looking a lot more relaxed than he was the other night. It's not as busy because there was no summons, 
You have no primogen council here, nothing. You do see M, the Nosferatu, in a corner, and only because they let you see them as you come in. You just see a few fingers slip out of a shadow and wiggle in your direction. And there's a decent number of kindred here. There's a lot of chattering and murmuring. Not so much dancing or anything like they do sometimes. It's very much a gossip event tonight, you think, based on vibes. And Sebastian comes up and, oh, darling, please, please tell me you're not bringing another great announcement or something in your wake. I really don't think two of those in one week is good for business. Do I seem like the announcement type? You know, but they often follow you, is my point. You know, I can't help it when certain kindred can't get enough of my face. It's quite a lovely face, darling. Always happy to see it here. Yes. I will catch up with you in a little bit. I have somebody I want to go speak to. Yes, just make sure you should save all the good gossip for your best friend, Sebastian. Well, I have to talk to everybody first. Toodaloo. And he floats off. I'm going to uh, make my way over to M, like not directly, you know, because they don't, if they don't want to be seen, I'm not going to make it obvious, you know, kind of like lean up against the wall or sit in a table Mm -hmm. nearby, that kind of thing. M is in a corner and you've worked with the Nosferatu before. You've done these kinds of meetings with them at Elysium back before Esme left you know how things are done. So you take a table against the wall where you can look out at everyone else in Elysium and you can quietly talk to M. And from your position, you'll notice if anyone is watching you to see if you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. Which is fine because I'd rather not look at them because, you know, Nosferatu. Yeah, Nosferatu. So you sit down and M says out of the dark, I was wondering if you'd show up tonight. It's been a while. Didn't get to talk last time. Yeah, someone kind of stole the show. Well, you know, kind of hard not to steal the show when you dump the Ventru Prince Regent's head onto a table. Well, that was purposeful. I quite enjoyed it, I have to say. Well, we're all glad he's gone. Yes. I think we'll stay. Yes. As long as Curtis and his little bunch of techno bros leave us alone. I think they're probably going to get iced out of the city or iced out of the city. Mm, Either way, crypto bullshit's going to fall one way or the other. Well, I mean, I'm sure they're not smart enough to have it not track directly back to them, so it's only a matter of time. Have you talked to Dawn yet? Dawn uh, is the new Ventru whip who was mm-hmm. elevated after the previous one uh, exposed himself to sunlight and got ashed. Uh, she is the owner of a strip club in downtown San Francisco for a Ventru, she's fairly no-nonsense. Out of all the Ventru you've worked with or or shared information with, she will at least talk directly to your face. No, I have not. Rumor on the street is Dawn's not happy with Curtis. Because Curtis is an asshole mm-hmm. and he's all bark and no bite. There's some fractures in Clan Ventru right now that might be fun to explore and exploit. Yeah, I might make a trip to that club. I mean, it's your type of club. That's also true. (laughs) We don't like Dawn necessarily because how can one like a Ventru? But if you have to talk to one, you might as well talk to her. Yeah. Curtis has the few of William's childer who are left. That's that's powerful bloodline, even if they're fledglings. That's a very powerful bloodline, Alex. We are concerned. So then we get rid of the bloodline. 
That's probably for the best. Where are they staying? I can find that for you. Because I have some probably interested parties that would have a use for them. Well, we'll see what we can find. All five of us are here back now. Just never know where to look. Not that you would look anyway. (laughs) No, but you'll find me. Yes, you are useful. But what do you have for us? There is bad news at the church in the middle of the city. On both sides of the veil. Calvary Baptist? The one with the strange preacher who knows things he shouldn't know? Yeah, I think so. But that was Mallet's doing, too. Both sides, you say? We did not know this. That is useful for us. Thank you. Mm. We will find things. Yes. Have a good night, Alex. You too. And there's a rustle in the shadow and then no more voice. And as M disappears, a small, slightly smelly gremlin comes ambling into Elysium. You can see Sylvester directly from your table. I could probably smell him. He did shower, but, you know, that was uh, last night. And so, therefore, it's probably not uh, holding on anymore. No comment. Uh, I will say he once again smells of his traditional uh, musk of cheap tobacco and cheap beer. Because it's a great cover in San Francisco, I tell you fucking what. But yeah, he's clearly looking around. So the thing is that we haven't actually had him realize just who Alex Giovanni is. You know that Alex was talking to Monica because you Mm -hmm. were there. You know that Alex was very, very dismissive of you. You also have seen Alex at all the important events you've been to in the city. Mm Mm-hmm. So even if you don't necessarily know who they are, you know that they've got their fingers in a lot of pies. They're connected. If they can't tell me what I want to know, they'll know someone who can. And they will love lording it over me. So you should definitely go talk to them. Absolutely. He is going to pull up a chair. Like, (laughs) he's tagged enough things about them that he's like, those looks, that suit. This is a fucking Hakata. Yeah, you've come across a few Hikata. You've met some Giovanni in the past. You've met some Hikata. You've interacted with most of the clans in various places in your travels. Necromancers. Yeah. They're weird and I don't care for it. Basically, Sylvester's attitude to anyone that does weird magic shit. But yeah, he is going to pull up a chair and he's going to do the Riker sit down where he kind of lifts the leg up over the chair and lowers himself in. And he's just like, good evening. I don't want to to, to annoy you, bud. I'm just going to get this off my chest and you can tell me where I'm right and wrong. You are Alex Giovanni of uh, Clan Hikata, correct? Correct. All right. I'm Sylvester Levillette of Clan Gangro. No. Mm. He's used to this shit from city vampires. He's like, yeah, it's a... So look, what I got to deal with is a bunch of vampire hunters. And given that you and I are both vampires, I have our mutual interest in mind there. So that's one thing. The second is that I have personal need your services. And uh, I know that ain't going to be cheap. Let's focus on our mutual issue. Here's what I know. What I know is that we've got somebody that's using very, very singular rhetoric about us dropping hints for second Inquisition types. They managed to kill a Nazi clan whip in her home. So they are connected and uh well their connection was mallet i guess as much yeah but 
I would remind you that Mallet's entire group is not destroyed. His blood boy is still somewhere unaccounted for. Oh, he's not unaccounted for. Find Curtis. Fair. That's actually a very good point I hadn't considered. What I need from you, I need to know what these hunters' capabilities are. I need to know what their equipment loadouts are, what their oper- how they hunt. I need to know, well, anything practical that you can tell me. And of course, the what you get in return is that I kill your hunters and then San Francisco goes back to being a little less shitty. How about you kill the hunters and you promise to get rid of Mallet's bloodline? And he leans back. He's like, yeah, I heard he made a bunch of new ones. How many when he was in the city? As far as I know, there's a few, but they're all still new. And the only person they have leading them is Curtis. <laughs> uh, leading isn't maybe the word you want there. But uh, yeah, I can I can look into that. I'll tell you what. My second ask is a bit more personal. You tell me how, what this is going to cost. There is a gangrel. Goes by the name of Olive. Now, I know you're close up with Monica West, so you know probably who I'm talking about. Very creatively, wears olive-colored clothing. I need to know how she hunts, who she hunts, when she hunts. I need to know everything you can get me. Why? Because she knows it about me. And I got a bad feeling about her. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now you tell me what that's going to cost. How about I tell you in a future date when I'm 100% certain? (laughs) I'll be delighted to hear it. What I can tell you about the hunters, I can actually tell you a lot. Because when you have access to a body, you can tell. The necromancy stuff, right? Sure. It looks like there were six of them that knew what they were doing. Mm Mm-hmm. Somehow they got the drop on her. Probably Mallet set them up, but pretty simple. Yeah, I know. I know that Mallet set her up. But considering there are wards and things that would normally stop something like that, still find suspicious, but depending what Mallet had access to, um, one of them, it looks like the leader is a woman with long dark hair and dark eyes. If you want, um, Rom could probably get the faces from me over to you. That's the, uh, the boat guy, right? Yeah. Okay. He deals with visions and stuff like that. Macavian, right. All right. I know that they use some kind of, they're using like some of the old school tropes, um, crucifixes, iron bars, things of that nature. So I think maybe Malik gave them specifics on her. They also said a Hebrew prayer. Uh, Yeah, look, these things get messy real fast depending on how deep you dig. But that's interesting to know. So how did they get, how did they get, you know, her? Because I was trying to figure out how I was going to get her. Uh, It seemed like they snuck up behind her and they started a fire. In her, in in her lair. Yeah. Which I think Mallet had more to do with that one in particular. Actually, I know he did. But as far as anybody else, I think they're just here trying to... Unless Mallet gave them a list. It could be coincidence that they took out one of the gang leaders. One of the anarch leaders. Or it's a hit list. Or it's a hit list. Based on what Mariam told me, it sounds like they lured him out of the Castro. That indicates three things. One... They likely have dossiers on most of the residents of San Francisco. I'm not one of those. Two, they know how to kill a a bruja in a fight. Three, 
they knew not to fuck with the Castro. All very good pieces of information. So, do you have a potential slayer or base of operations for these folks? Do you got a, a ringleader? The best I can tell is the one woman with long dark hair and dark eyes. Like I said, if you want the picture, I'm sure Ram can probably give you the whole vision. That's that's pretty much what I have. I only get the victim's last view. Sure. Yeah. You get you see through their eyes and he like puts his hand across <laughs> like raised up above them and he just does the left to right pan. Yeah, you, you see what they see in their final moments. That's fair. I get it. Which she's not a ghost, if you're wondering. That, that does make me a little bit happy. That's great. Thank her you, victims but. weren't didn't take too kindly to her crossing over. Something for us all to think about. So we'll leave that there for the moment then. For we'll leave Alex and Sylvester finding some common ground, even if Alex isn't too happy about it. <laughs> and uh Monica, you went to pick up Annalise. Oh god, I hope she's at that house. You go to your house, you see Malarkey outside on the porch with the cats, he waves. And your front door is locked. You unlock it and you go in. And Annalise is sitting on the couch with the TV on, very, very intently watching the Brady Bunch. Monica, when she closes that door behind her, almost staggers into the door with relief. And there's a brief moment where she's like, I cannot believe I am feeling this much relief to see a Tremere. How life has changed so dramatically in the last six months. Hi, Annalise. Hi. This is a very weird family. <laughs> is this real? Um, I don't know, honey. I think, I think we're all redefining what family means to us now. Oh, you're talking about the television show. Sorry. No, those are actors. That's fake. That's completely fake. Sorry. Hey, I need to take you to a new house. But this, I like this one. Um, you know, I'm actually not a big fan of it, if you can believe that. And she's going to cross in front of her um, and kneel down where she's like, at least eye to eye with her. I need to ask you a handful of questions. And if you can, I'd really appreciate it if you were honest with me. Okay? Oh, I always tell the truth. You're so creepy. And it's completely okay. Hey, all right. So question number one, what, what, what is this effect that you have on people that come into contact with you? The boy that was crying at the boutique shop. I've seen it happen before. What What is that? It's, um, it's called unsettling aura. Okay. It's because I'm a child that isn't a child. And some things like cats and dogs and small human children can feel that there's something wrong and it makes them cry. That's why mom wouldn't let me go anywhere. I'm sorry. That has to be incredibly isolating. I'm sorry. Second question for you, sweetheart. Are you familiar with the history between our two clans? Yes, some of it. Okay. Mom said that you taste very good and she was right. Okay. Is that the extent of your understanding? Of the history between our clans? Mom said that sometimes we like to eat you or your clan more than we eat other things, but that the Camarilla said in 1536 that this was not okay and we weren't allowed to do that anymore and that we should probably stop. It's a very academic response, Annalise. Do you know what that actually means in application? No. That means your clan practically annihilated my clan. Over the course of centuries, your clan nearly wiped ours off the board. Did you deserve it? No. Your clan was upset because they couldn't get a seat at the big kids' table. No, Annalise, if you can't tell, and Monica's going to roll her shoulders back, I am doing everything in my power to give you accurate information and to afford you as much agency as possible because I have an ask coming at the end of these questions, and it is a big ask. And I want to make sure that, however brief, you are as informed as possible. Okay. 
Did you know your mother was a Nazi? I had some suspicions. We came to America a while ago, and then we came to San Francisco on a train. It was my first time on a train. It was very exciting. But then in 1937, Mom said she had to go on a business trip and that I couldn't come because it was dangerous and it might scare people. And so she went somewhere and she didn't tell me where. And then she came back in 1945. And at some point, I kind of put those pieces together. Yeah. That in a very short time, your mother actually facilitated the deaths of over 11 million people. Oh. Yeah. And that's just including the kind, honey. Your mother was very busy. Yeah. I figured some of it out, but mom wouldn't tell me a lot. She said, you are my precious child and I must protect you. She does a passable imitation of her mother's voice. And that is going to send a chill directly through every single layer of Monica. I only got to do some blood rituals sometimes because she said she didn't want me tainting my aura. She literally does air quotes around it. And that she had to do some things to make sure that our family was safe. And that we would be the best family forever. Annalise, your mother is dead and she's not coming back. I, I know. You don't have a family. And as cruel as this may sound, all you have is me. Because every other kindred in this city wants you dead. I am the sole person advocating for your safety. I don't know why. I don't either. And that's something I'll probably have to talk out in centuries worth of therapy. But for right now, this is where we are in the moment. Three more questions, sweetheart. Are you with me? I can count to three, yes. Okay. That that wasn't actually my question, but that was actually really cute. Um, do you know what happens if you feed on me one more time? Blood bond. Okay. I know what blood bonds are. Okay. Do you know what happens if you don't feed on me? If you can't have access to me, if you're unable to feed from me. I get the munchies. That's what mom used to call it when she got hungry. It's not hungry, child. It's not hunger. It's something different. Because if you don't get access to me, if I die or if we separate from each other, you will literally tear this city apart looking for something that's close to me. I guess I just can't go too far away then. That's my thought process too, little one. Okay, final two. There are hunters in the city. I know, they killed my mom. I was there. If they could take down your mother given all of her power, I don't know how much resistance a lot of the others, a lot of us, can put up. So what's your question? Are you willing to be bonded to me? Will you bond with me? We'll pray about that. My question first. If you bond with me, mom said blood bonds should be both ways. Otherwise, it's like indentured servitude. Yep, we'll pray about that. Okay, last question, and this is the big one. Do you want to be like this forever? Eight? Well, I can't fix that, unfortunately. But that aura that you have, this anger that you feel, this isolation that you're grappling with, is that something that you want to stick with forever? Or if I could fix it, if I could heal it, would you be open to that? Fix it? I didn't know you could do that. Well, if there were more salubri around, people would know what we could do. But again, single digits. That's not my fault. It's not. I'm not blaming you. I'm offering to help you. She's quiet for a moment, and you just see just a brief flash of something very old in her eyes. I don't like being by myself. And mom said it was because I had to be safe, but it's very hard being eight, but also being 400. And I know I'm old, and I know I have more power than you do in a lot of ways because I'm older than you. But I need, I need more people around me. I don't want to be in a bedroom forever. If you can fix things 
so I can be around other vampires. Maybe being eight forever will be easier. If this works, you might not have to be alone anymore. We'll pray about it. Wow, you brought that right back to me, didn't you? And then she's going to come up on her hips and try to pick this child up and just get her into her arms. You pick her up and she looks at you with these very old eyes and this very young face and says, I know a lot of things in my head, but I don't know a lot of things for real. Mom wouldn't let me. And now maybe I get to grow up. Somehow. I think Monica is going to nose to nose her and then um, kiss her on the cheek. I don't know, sweetie. But we're going to try. She's going to snatch up her keys. She's going to snatch up her purse. Uh, She is going to put her into the car. And they are going back to her haven above Mackay Gardens number one. All right. So Monica takes Annalise off to her haven. And uh, meanwhile, Katarina and Vlad have been having some fun. Sophie's uh, fingernails are embedded, like, inside of her fingers. And she no longer has separate legs. They've been crafted together from the knee down. So that she's basically a mermaid. And she's unchained at this point. Sophie passed out at some point. Vlad asked you when he started working if you wanted him to bite her and give her some of the natural bliss from the bite to make it a bit easier on her. And, well, you weren't into that, were you? No. No. So she started screaming fairly early on. See, Vlad is blissfully okay with this as he's humming something to himself and removing bits from the body that he brought in, throwing some bits back into the box. This will do. And he starts rearranging Sophie's fingers, or rather her fingernails. He really seems to enjoy melding her legs together. This is the bit where she passes out completely. And he has to pause and he bites her and feeds a little bit. He says that will help a little bit uh, not to uh, die. <laughs> Don't want that. And he's working very cheerfully and you're just standing there watching. And Katarina, you're going to take a stain for this as you're just cold and clear watching this human woman being flesh crafted into some horrific monstrosity and you don't care. It feels good, actually. So you're going to take a stain. Okay. Can I, can I wake her up? Absolutely. Okay, good. So I'm going to wake her up and let her try to, you know, escape. And that's not going to happen because she doesn't have legs anymore. Yeah, she she wakes up as after Vlad finishes that bit of work and wipes his bloody hands off on a paper towel. And she starts thrashing when she realizes she's not chained anymore. And then she realizes that she can't move her legs except in one kind of motion. It's very hard with your hips when you're used to having two legs and suddenly you only have one. And she starts screaming again, this time in panic. So I'm going to use awe on her to, cal- to calm her down. So you activate awe. She calms. <laughs> but she is still panicky and terrified. So you are going to stay like this for a little while until you give me what I need. And I will not be the one asking the questions. The man who took your boss's head will get what he needs from you. You're a monster. I know. And now you are too. And she just completely buckles. The horror of what she's going through is too much for her mind at the moment, and she just collapses. 
physically and mentally for the moment. And Vlad wipes his hands and looks down and says, hmm, very nice. These are not bad work, no? No, you did a very good job. I thank you for your services. He's good. If you uh, want more, let know. We do uh, exchange for one, yes? Yes. I do more work with one uh, arrangement. Yes. Once she is more cooperative and more giving, I will perhaps give her more privileges and I may call on you again. More privileges, more uh, fingernails. <laughs> Maybe yes. uh, more teeth. It's nice mm. put teeth in the back of neck, in the ears. Well, on the, on the spine. Oh, I have not done spine yet. It's a good idea. Yes, so thank you very much. I will see you at the clinic. Mm, see you tomorrow night. Yes, we open. Hmm? Yes, finally. It's time. Okay, and he picks up the box, which now has very few body parts in it, but he kept a few and some bones. And uh, it's, it's a good time. I like you. And he just starts whistling and cheerfully saunters out. So after he leaves, I'm going to pick Sophie up because vampire strength. Isn't this fun? She just lets out a low, horrified moan. <laughs> and we'll leave you there with a very horrified Sophie. Marcus, you have arrived with your goodie bag for Rom at your appointed meeting place. Rom, are you already there or are you fashionably late? Oh, no, I'm already there. I'm at the port of San Francisco General Building. Um, I push I push the little button that opens the door automatically and I walk inside. Yeah, so uh, I'm meeting you roughly in, on the outside of the building in the port of San Francisco with the big, nice neon glow and the bay water. Um, and so uh, I'll, uh, I'll drive up and then stop and get out of the car. And uh, when I spot Rom, which hopefully isn't terribly hard given the flip-flops, then I'll just give a, a simple gesture, a come hither. And there's a, a, a very strange smile on my face. Yeah, yeah, I'm cautious here. I'm like, hey, Marcus. I, uh, what are you doing? I wipe my mouth. Oh, I've just some, um, I've been jogging recently. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's that's good. You gotta you gotta stay fit, man. It's true. It's true. It's important to keep everything in working order. Yeah. Hey. Uh, we're good, right? Yeah, we're good. There's no okay. issue. Okay. We're good. So listen. Um, I step a little. I step a little closer. Um, and I produce a cellular phone. That's not mine. Nope. You're right, it's not. I gesture with my head over to the passenger side of the car. You see that there's a person with their coat like up over their head. And they Is that a be, people? They seem to be maybe a little bit less than well mobile. Well no, because you got your mo they're mobile right there in your hand. All right. Nice. This person was watching the burned out remains of the union office. They were also adorned quite skillfully with crosses and garlic. I go into my pocket, my other jacket pocket, and I produce a small camera. They were watching the union office. They had a voice recorder running. They had a camera. Now, I'm certain that there's a bevy of information available to us here. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's highly likely they didn't have it integrated into some system or transmitting remotely. Um, or even if they did, they might have had a localized backup. Have you looked on this device for any sort of SD slot? I 
Or... The best thing, I haven't done anything with the camera just yet. I came here because of time. Okay. But it's something we can look into. I open the passenger car door and I pull back down the uh, the jacket to reveal somebody who's looks like they've been through a, a series of unfortunate events, but somehow seemingly has a big, happy smile on their face. Yeah, hey... What's your long-term plans for that, uh, that, that, that pe- people's, that person's? Oh, I think that they're probably a font of potential information, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what we're doing now. Okay. All right. Hold on. You know what? I love this. I'm going to go ahead and shift energy. All right. Cool. I'm here for this. Perfect. So we'll leave this episode with Marcus and Rom heading back to Rom's boat with some very interesting presents and perhaps some information to learn. And uh, we'll see what everyone learns next time. Thank you and good night. Good night.